turn off my thing because it's better receptive. Yeah, okay. right. Okay. So, so um, welcome everyone to this. Um, this is for those who don't know. The current Zoom cast is an initiative that we started off in UCD Architecture, um, just uh, during the pandemic. I guess when everybody was working remotely, it was just a way of um, keeping contact with students and people interested in architecture and the built environment. And we've had a whole series of programs running since last September, October, I guess, um, involving lots of the other school, all the other schools of architecture in Ireland and lots of people from elsewhere. Um, and so today we're really delighted to have um, a, this uh, discussion, debate um, between uh, Frank McDonald um, and Johnny Ronan and Johnny Ronan and his uh, team. Um, and the debate, I guess, is prompted by the proposal uh, for what's called Waterford South Central development in Spencer Place next to Spencer Dock uh, down in the, uh, well, north Docklands, actually. Um, and particularly the, the two towers, one over 40 stories of 167 metres and the latter about, I think, 25 metres lower, around about that, and the sort of larger development, which is currently being considered by on board Planola. As people will probably know, um, in late February, uh, 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 Frank McDonald had a piece in the Irish Times, which was, I suppose, um, de debating the merits of that project, and maybe more generally raising the question of high-rise development in the city, whether it was appropriate, where it should happen and why. And then uh, a week later, we had a, a, a Johnny Ronan uh, published a response to that. And in a way, what we're wanting to do today is to just to maybe to bring those two um, sides together uh, to debate um, the particular project and maybe the larger questions of development in the city, the need for high rise, appropriate, where should it happen and why. Just introduce myself, by the way, I'm Hugh Campbell. I'm the head of architecture uh, in UCD. And just to give a very brief introduction to our two main contributors, uh, Frank McDonald, people uh, will know, I'm sure, as the longtime environment editor for the Irish Times, author of seminal books on the city, uh, really a kind of campaigning journalist uh, um, about the city, uh, starting with his book, The Destruction of Dublin in 1985, and then The Construction of Dublin in 2000, and more recently, his memoir, Truly Frank, from 2018, and Frank's still a regular contributor um, to the Irish Times and other publications. Johnny Ronan. Um, originally set, setting up treasury holdings and developing a lot of very significant buildings in the city, into, including the Tower Convention Center, of course, and then laterally as principal with Ronan Group, um, currently developing, again, numerous projects across the city, including other buildings in the Docklands, Facebook headquarters in Bowles Bridge, and the Waterford Sound Central development that we're going to be focusing on today. So our format today is we are going to have hear from both sides, so to speak, for uh, about 15 minutes each. We're going to hear from Frank in the first instance, then we're going to hear from Johnny, and I know that Johnny has a number of other people on the team, because there's a large team involved in this project, who are also going to contribute during that 15 minutes. I'm not going to have a chance to introduce all of them, but they, I think, will introduce themselves as we go. And then we open it up for discussion. We'll have about 20 minutes, half an hour at the end. Hopefully, we, we'll, we'll try to close at about 2.10, something like that. Um, I'd ask people in general, if you're, you're, you are unmuted or you are muted, just to keep things coherent. So if you have question, uh, if you put things into the chat, uh, I'll either go to you and ask you to unmute or I'll just um, relay your question uh, to the main speakers. Um, and if possible, I'd like to privilege questions from students because this is a student led initiative. And I should say that um, the idea for this debate was originated by what well, came to us via Mark Price, who is a design fellow in the School of Architecture. Um, and Mark credits Jim Norton, who is also in the audience somewhere uh, with the original idea. And uh, from my point of view, is certainly Owen O'Connor, who's one of the student organizers of Current, uh, was really instrumental in uh, getting it over the line. So thanks to all of them for making this happen. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Frank. Um, to uh, kick things off. Frank. Thanks very much uh, for that, Hugh. Um, I'm old enough to remember how excited we all were when Liberty Hall was going up uh, in the 1960s. And 
I suppose it seemed to us to mark the emergence of a modern Ireland, as if Dublin was embracing the future. Um, and I just wanted to share a pic of it under construction. Uh, and, and when it was completed, when it was uh, a building that was so transparent that you, you could actually see right through it. Um, and uh, sorry, I've, I've lost it now, uh, sorry. Oh, God. Um, but I also remember being shocked when the truly marvellous Theatre Royal on Hawkins Street was torn down in the name of progress and replaced by the horror that is uh, Hawkins House. Um, the high rise lobby would have us believe that the proposed residential towers of Waterfront South Central also represent progress, making Dublin more competitive with other cities. But I don't buy that argument because uh, if you look at what's happening in Manchester, the skyline is now pockmarked by random high rise eruptions. And so is the Vauxhall area of London, all as a result of developer led planning. Um, I had pictures of nine elves as well um, in Vauxhall. Yeah, that's nine elves. Okay. Um, and all of this is happening as a result of developer-led planning. Uh, Waterfront South Central, uh, which is um, a very curious name, given that it's on the north side, uh, is the most egregious example we've seen so far of such developer-led planning in Dublin, and on a massive scale. When I first got a briefing on the scheme from, uh, from Paul O'Brien, uh, from HJL, um, and... Uh, I think that was in May 2019. Uh, I was um, I was astonished by what was being proposed. Absolutely astonished that such a quantum leap in building heights was being proposed for Dublin. Two enormous towers are planned: 41 stories and 45 stories in height. The taller of the two would be double the height of the 79 meter capital dock tower just across the river. The Ronan Group and Colony Capital bought the site, the four and a half acre site on North Wall Quay in October 2018 for 180 million, confidently expecting that they could swing planning permission for a mega high rise scheme. What they were betting on was that Owen Murphy's building height guidelines, which had already been published in draft form, would inaugurate a planning free-for-all for, for high-rise development in Dublin. In particular, they anticipated that these mandatory guidelines, which were promulgated by Murphy in, in December 2018, would trump Dublin City Council's strategic development zone planning scheme for the Docklands area. It's very, very important to note that this statutory SDZ planning scheme was adopted by the elected members of Dublin City Council in 2013 and subsequently approved by on board Planola. One could argue that the scheme wasn't ambitious enough in allowing for greater building heights, but it's generally seen as successful in steering Docklands development over the past seven years. But for the past two years, using the slogan, Grow Up Dublin, the Ronan Group has been engaged in an ongoing campaign to override and even subvert the democratically adopted planning scheme for the area. They've been aided and abetted by onboard Planola itself, which was more than willing to grant permission for extra floors on two Ronan Group developments in Docklands that clearly breached the planning scheme. The same scheme indeed that the board itself had approved. Dublin City Council sought judicial reviews uh, of these decisions and the High Court on three separate occasions upheld the planning scheme and quashed the permissions granted by the board ruling them to be invalid. Meanwhile, on foot of Owen Murphy's ministerial guidelines on building heights, Dublin City Council planners brought forward a series of amendments to the Docklands planning scheme, allowing for greater heights. Specifically in relation to the North Wall Quay site, the amendments proposed a so-called Liffey Gateway residential tower of up to 25 storeys, and another of 12 stories as a local landmark on its Mayor Street frontage. Under the 2014 planning scheme, 
the maximum building heights on this particular site, which is known uh, as City Block 9, were set at eight to 10 stories. So the latest version clearly provided for a significant increase in height. But although the amended planning scheme was submitted to on board Pinole in May 2019, the board then sat on it for 21 months before finally issuing its recent decision, declining to approve it. The planning inspector who dealt with the case had recommended that it should be approved, but the board took the view that the changes proposed were, quote, minimal and didn't aim high enough. I don't think there would be many people in Dublin, myself included, who would object to a well-designed landmark 25-storey residential tower on the North Wall Quay site. So it's the extra 20 floors that you object to, Johnny Ronan said to me. Exactly so, I said. That's what raises it to a Manhattan scale, which is simply wrong for Dublin. The fact is that the vast bulk of docklands has already been developed in accordance with Dublin City Council's planning scheme. So why on earth should an exception be made in this case? What facilitates it, of course, is not only the building height guidelines, but also the fact that it's classified as a strategic housing development or SHD that goes direct to onboard Planola bypassing the city council. Pre-planning consultations between the board and the developers all done behind closed doors got underway more than 12 months before the formal planning application was lodged last January. The only indication that members of the public had that this was happening was that a balsa wood model of the proposed development was on view in the foyer of onboard Planola's offices in Marlborough Street. Thus, as I wrote in my submission to the board, the stage was set for what I regard as a wildly surreal and hubristic play that should have been cancelled immediately after its first performance. And even by the bloated standards that we've become used to for SHD applications, the volume of verbiage spewed out in support of this super tall proposal has reached epic proportions, running into thousands of pages. This has all been compiled by a vast team of architects, planning consultants, CGI specialists and others drawn from what's become known and rightly so as the planning industrial complex. They claim that what's proposed would be a world class development, that it would create a proud community in a high rise garden village at, in the heart of Dublin's new waterfront district. The idea that all of the densely planted terraces, lush green walls and even allotments for residents to tend to would all survive at such heights is in an exposed windy setting is a complete fantasy. Um, I wanted to show you a picture of the, uh, the, the, the view from the second floor. Uh, if I can share that. Yeah, we're seeing that. It's You're seeing it, floor. okay. It's higher than the second floor. All right. That gives you an idea of the lush greenery that's, that's being proposed. But, you know, if you look at, at Bosco Verticale in Milan in midwinter, that's... Uh, uh, an, uh, you can see that it looks it looks rather different, and don't forget that bear, that that the trees and shrubs and flowering plants plants of Bosco Verticale are mostly located on private balconies and terraces. If all of the communal hanging gardens in Waterfront South Central were to be maintained into the future, it could only be done by levying very steep annual service charges on the residents. At ground level, there would be very uh, relatively few facilities. Um, uh, a restaurant, two cafes, a food hall and a florist opening onto public spaces within the scheme rather than, uh, rather than on, um, hold on, I'll just try and get you the view, of the, view, the view of the ground level. There. Yeah. And you have to, and, 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 and because of the shadows cast by the overbearing towers, a proposed pocket park within the scheme may not get sufficient sunlight and could therefore be uninviting, according to Dublin City Council's planners. The design has gone through several iterations, and this may explain why the form and profile of the two towers 
fail to convey a truly memorable uh, image, uh, such, as, such as, for example, if I can find the bloody thing, um, the gherkin in London, or the shard in London, which are both very memorable, uh, me very memorable images. Um, or indeed, they fail to convey the, the, the memorable image that the original U2 tower proposed uh, by uh, um, Burden Dunn for the site that was eventually developed for Capital Dock, or even the watchtower that was proposed by Scott Talon Walker for the site that was eventually developed for uh, um, uh, the EXO building designed by uh, Shea Cleary. Um, if anything, the scheme that's now being proposed uh, seems to symbolize, the Waterfront South Central scheme as it's designed, seems to symbolize what I described as Johnny Ronan effectively giving two fingers to Dublin and the generally low rise nature uh, of the city. Of the 1,005 apartments, uh, 490 would be one bedroom units and two and 500 would be two bedroom units. Um, leaving only 15 units within the scheme that would have three bedrooms and they're all luxury penthouses at the higher levels. Only 433 apartments would have, uh, uh, would have dual, would be dual aspect with views out in two directions and 75 of the 474 single aspect units would be north facing only. And you just have to ask yourself, what would they be like to live in? 105 apartments would be social housing units and these would all be clustered at lower levels at the rear with meaner floor to ceiling heights and their own separate entrance. Dublin City Council has been told by the developers that the social housing requirement uh, or the social housing element, which is required by part five of the 2000 Planning Act, would cost an average of, wait for it, 663,000 euro per unit. If that's what the social housing is going to cost, you can just imagine the eye-watering prices that would be charged either to buy or rent any of the private sector apartments. Thus the idea that Waterfront South Central would contribute in any way to relieving the housing crisis in Dublin which is essentially a crisis of housing affordability, is also a fantasy. Right across the river, uh, nearly, nearly half of the, um, of the apartments in the, in the 190 apartments in the Capital Dock uh, Tower, which I think is one of the dreariest schemes that's ever been built in Dublin, um, are still vacant two years after it was completed. The reason is that the quoted rents 2,500 per month for one bedroom flats, 3,000 for two bed flats, and 4,000 or more for three beds are too high for the market to bear. Of course, it costs a lot more, and we have to bear this in mind, it costs a lot more per square meter to build high rise residential because more lifts are required as well as extra fire safety precautions such as sprinkler systems and secondary staircases. Um, years ago on a guided tour of, of Santiago Calatrava's um, uh, tor turning torso in, in, in Malmo, uh, I, um, I, I, I remember feeling so claustrophobic inside that building that I couldn't wait to get out. Um, the turning torso building, uh, if I can find a picture of it, um, here we go, turning torso. And while you're at it, here's 433, 432 Park Avenue in New York as well. Um, can you see them? You have to go back to share. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about this. Need, I'm, you, I'm, you I'm, a novice. I'm a novice at this. You're all right. You've probably got about a couple of more minutes, Frank. Okay. That... Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, see them now. You need to just... Okay, in cities such as New York and, uh, and London, resident, tall residential towers have become money trees rather than places for people to live, full of trophy apartments for the super rich. I'm not, uh, uh, yet there's a big push on here, not just to get this scheme over the line, but lots of others too, 
under the SHD legislation that was drafted by the property lobby as one of its members re recalled. Referring to Simon Coveney, who was Minister for Housing and Planning in 2017, he said, quote, we met him four times over about six or seven weeks for amazing actually, from eight o'clock at night until midnight. And he went through his vision, what his vision was for the Irish planning and property system. And we gave him our recommendations and they, the civil servants meaning, meaning took it lock, stock and barrel and stuck it into the new housing bill. So let's be clear, between the SHD legislation, the building height guidelines and the dumbed down BTR apartment design standards, the property lobby has been in the driving seat for the past four years. What's happening in effect is that Dublin is being commodified for international capital investment, whether it's housing uh, or student housing, uh, office blocks or hotels. And this is now playing itself out in the planning arena with on board Planola granting permission for high rise housing schemes that simply wouldn't be permitted under the normal planning process. There is already provision for high rise buildings in the current Dublin city plan. It actually designates four areas where high rise of over 50 meters is permitted and 10 areas for mid rise up to 50, up to 50 meters in height. Yet it's now happening everywhere as exemplified by the Heinz high rise schemes for the player will sites of South Circular Road, uh, also incidentally designed by HJL with four tower blocks, one of them taller than Liberty Hall. If Dublin is to have a high rise future, the decisions around that should be made by the elected representatives of the people on the city council during the current review of the city plan with full public participation and emphatically not by on board Planola or the planning industrial complex. Thank you, Frank. That felt like a conclusion. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's great. Thanks a lot, Frank. Okay. Um, I think what I might do is uh, introduce uh, our team uh, and let them pr proceed with our 15 minute presentation, if, if that's helpful. Okay, so we're going to hear from, uh, yeah, are we going to hear from Johnny and then John or how are you going to do it? You, you, you tell us. Indeed, yeah, I'll, I'll fire ahead if you don't mind, Hugh. And um, so I, I suppose, you know, the one thing we can all agree on is, you know, the importance of the Georgian core of Dublin, uh, which is special and, and should always be protected. So. You know, that alongside the fact that with any height, you know, a prerequisite for any height in Dublin must be a quality design. So I suppose delivering a world class scheme today, you know, it, it requires many minds. Uh, and, you know, at Waterfront, we have the expertise of 27 different practices which have led to the proposed scheme you see today, uh, including a handful of representatives we have today, uh, 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 including Tom Phillips, who's the principal of TPA Planning Consultants. Uh, and he'll direct your questions to the relevant design team members uh, 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 as we proceed today. Richard Coleman, who's principal at City Designers and uh, who has vast experience in projects, including Windsor Castle and the Gherkin in London, which Frank referenced earlier uh, uh, in the presentation. Uh, and Paul O'Brien, who's chairman of Henry J. Lyons Architects, who I'm sure everyone on this call will be familiar with. So without further ado, I'd like you to, to pass you on to Tom Phillips initially. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, John. I should tell you that that's uh, John Ronan Jr. I just gave the presentation there. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. And we're very glad to get involved in this uh, student initiative. Uh, we have at the start a short video that is on the Waterford, Waterfront South Central SHD website, and it might be useful. But just to put it in, in context before we do, the site is a two hectare site and the strategic housing development uh, element of it is on approximately one hectare of it. On the other half of the site, is um, an, a, what we call a NSDZ compliant commercial scheme. So a lot of the debate and discussion about the scheme is about the strategic housing development element and with little if no debate about the, the SDZ compliant element. So we have a scheme that half of the site is fully compliant with the planning scheme and the other half is a strategic housing development scheme. So in terms of strategic housing development, um, the, as a member of, of and Frank refers to the planning industrial complex, it's very unusual to be criticised for giving too much information because one of the criticisms by third parties usually is the lack of information. So what we have done in the application is to do a very thorough, detailed uh, submission from 25 different practices, including a review by three different legal practices because of the propensity of people to take judicial reviews against strategic housing development. So we try, we've sought to be very, very thorough. And in the people who will be here today uh, to speak, 
Uh, I mean, I, I can show you that the 300 participants are here to hear Johnny Rowan and not to hear me or any other member of the team. But Johnny's very keen on the, on the point, this is a team effort. So Johnny is the captain of the team and the rest of us are on the team. We have 25 different companies. Let's hear from the captain then. Sorry, Frank, I didn't, much as I would like to have interrupted you, I didn't. So if you could extend us the same courtesy, I'd appreciate it. So we have um, just a short video will show. I think set the, uh, I might ask that maybe, I don't think, I would prefer we heard from some of the team players. Okay, and, fine, okay. Rather than see a video. Well, I might just give, okay, well. Uh, just, just refer just, briefly to a video. Okay, maybe. well, the video is on the website. Yeah, so exactly. We'll hand over, I might just hand over first to Richard Coleman, who, as John Jr. said, is uh, a, a leading expert on the interpretation of tall buildings has been members of CABE in the UK and worked on uh, numerous uh, major schemes in London and elsewhere, including the Gherkin. So Richard, if you want to just say a few words and then we'll go on to the next speaker. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, very happy to do that. Um, good afternoon, Frank. We've, um, we've sparred before now. Yes. Um, I, I think that the subject of tall buildings is always uh, raises an awful lot of emotion and obviously a lot of scrutiny and both these things are perfectly natural. Um, the fact is that tall buildings are, are sometimes good and sometimes bad and they have a bad history because of the uh, immediate post-war rash of tall buildings that were not properly designed, not um, and sometimes not at all, not at all managed. Uh, today we are in a quite different situation where Tall buildings, in order them to function as an economic unit, have to be incredibly well designed and everything has to be worked out and proven to a planning department um, or whoever the planning decision makers are. Um, and we, as uh, Tom Phillips has said, have done that in a great thorough way. My own role has been to encourage the architects in the direction of high quality, not that they didn't wish to do that, but there are always balanced issues to deal with when you're dealing with the economy, with the climate, microclimate, sustainability, so many aspects which uh, bear on a building design today, um, which, uh, you know, they require guidance. And especially when you're placing a building which would become a major landmark in a, such an important city as Dublin, um, then, uh, you, you know, one has to be uh, clear that, um, all these aspects need to be um, synthesized into something which is really great. And, and I believe that is where we've got to with this building. I mean, Frank uh, shows the, 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 um, uh, the, the two London examples, the Gherkin and the Shard. Um, I was involved in one of them. I was very doubtful about the Shard being a part of a view involving St Paul's Cathedral from uh, uh, Hampstead Heath. Um, but nevertheless, that did get permission through the central government process that we have in, our, in the UK. And the board is, is similar to that. The board is uh, non-political, which is a much better thing than the um, principles we have uh, for public inquiries overseen by a Secretary of State in the UK. So whether you like the board or not, um, Frank, I think it's a very good device as an overseer of planning. Uh, in this case, we've got a housing development which goes straight to planning and the City Council are perfectly um, able to make comment and point to areas of which they feel are, are deficient or at fault. So in terms of design quality, this is for this site, it arises from the conditions of this site, which are not the same as the Shard at London Bridge, not the same as the Gherkin at that particular time in uh, the history of tall buildings in London. It is specific to this site. So it arises out of the conditions of this site, brief and the architect's inspiration and the guidance of all those around that to make sure that it is of the highest quality. Second thing is that when you're building a high building, it needs to be a height which does not intrude in an undue way on important historic parts of the city. And we've ensured that that's been my role I've, I've called upon the team on a number of occasions to come with me to look at certain street views, to look at sites and to envisage the new building and talk and debate together with Johnny himself about what this building should provide for the city in those views where it's, where it's present. So in those views where it's present, it's got a public space at the top of it, a delight for people to move towards and then get fantastic views. 
in terms of its height, it's tailored very definitively to not intrude on the important Georgian spaces within the city. And it seems that Frank is happy with that since he hasn't mentioned it today. We're all, as John and Ronan said, oh, yeah. we're all um, on accord with that aspect of it. Um, so it's a question of vision, and it's true that it's not a vision from the city council, and such projects don't arise very often from city council offices, uh, either in London or the UK, uh, elsewhere in the UK, uh, or elsewhere in Europe. They arise out of an idea that somebody has, which they pursue. And in this case, we're now in a position, a very strange position, where there is no SDZ that's agreed. Um, we are in the hands of a planning board, which is your premier, pre, premier planning um, uh, authority. And the city council is a major consultant to that process. I think this is a perfectly acceptable arrangement. And we look forward to seeing what the uh, planning board decides. Thank you, Richard. I'm just going to hand over uh, briefly in a second to Paul O'Brien, but I know a lot of the chat is very keen to hear from Johnny, so we'll just give a, a short presentation by Paul, and then I'll, I'll ask Johnny Rowland to just say a few words and a few responses. But just one of the comments was, I just noticed on the chat, was how come there are no women on our team? There, I can assure you there are two of the principal architects who worked on designing the buildings are both in maternity leave, so they would have been here otherwise. So that's, that's the answer to that particular question. And Kira Slaffery, my colleague, is on the presentation as well and uh, led us in our office along with me. So but I can assure you there's been a very balanced, gender balance in the design of this building. It just happens that today that the speakers are male, but no other reason than two of the speakers are on maternity leave. So with that bit of a segue, Paul, to you, if you would, Paul is the chairman of Henry J. Lyons. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul O'Brien. Um, I'm an architect with Henry J. Lyons Architects. And, um, as Tom just said, there are quite a number of uh, ladies that have worked with me on this project. So it's not just a male dominated team. It's very much, and indeed throughout our own practice, it's very much 50-50. Um, just to talk about initially about some of the points that came up uh, from Frank's piece, um, I'm very, uh, I've followed Docklands all through the years. Um, the Andy Burden scheme that Frank showed was the original precursor to the U2 tower, but then there was the Norman Foster design scheme that was much, much higher and got full planning permission um, just near to the site of Capital Docks. Uh, right beside our site, there was a proposal by Zaha Hadid for a 45 story. Uh, tower that never went through the planning uh, scheme, but you know, as Frank showed, there was the watchtower. There was a scheme um, by Kevin Roach behind the convention center for quite a large and substantial hotel building. So to say that this is a a first or something down in Docklands, it is not. There's been a history of uh, planning for tall buildings in Dublin Docklands. Um, and the other point I, I found quite funny, you know, when Frank said, you know, that uh, the SDZ was adopted by councillors, you know, Frank, you were the first that uh, were, was against, say, uh, the, our proposals on Tara Street. And even when uh, the councillors voted again for a 22 storey building on the site, you were still against it. So it seems to be apples uh, and carrots for different sort of stories. Um, in terms of Bosco Vertical, we looked at that in great detail and we talked to the people who actually designed it. We talked to the people who did all the horticulture in it. Uh, we did not propose for a lot of the, and you can see a lot of deciduous type tree planting on the balconies. Uh, it's very, um, I suppose, you know, it, it changes during the winter, but it also is e extremely expensive to maintain. What we have is a system that was designed by experts, is a fully irrigated system. It will work at the higher levels, and we have all of that verified in our documentation. Um, in terms of what Frank said on the pocket park, there was a pocket park shown in the SCZ and we had to show that. Um, I, I don't know if I can, can I share my screen as well? 
Yeah, I'm conscious of just the overall. Now we've got about five minutes, maybe four. Five oh, minutes okay. I listen, I, 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 I'll just keep on talking. Then I, I don't have. I, I didn't find this discussion really more on on architecture. I was going to talk a little bit about the architecture, but I think it's it's gone to uh, more about uh, planning. And I see even in the chats, it's more about economics. Um, and just a, a few things on economics. Just very, very quickly, uh, the cost of high-rise buildings uh, is not uh, significantly per square meter per square foot higher than a six or seven story building. In fact, site infrastructure and everything uh, is just marginally greater. So the cost per square meter, there is no real difference. I could show you documents from all of the top, and I have reached out to them all, all of the top quantities the surveying uh, practices around the, the country and they'll all say the same thing where does the cost come from well when you go higher you will have to spend more money on fenestrations and design and that's really where the cost comes when you go higher you're going to spend more money on the elevations and that's why invariably taller buildings are more expensive and the higher you are the more expense on the fenestrations I've got to end there. Uh, I'd like other people to join in. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I'll just call on Johnny in a, in a minute, but I just would like to respond to some of the response on the or comments on the chat. But why don't we, no, 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 Tom, why don't we go to Johnny and then the whole well, that, is that we, you just, we, just the comments, we John, will get to the comments on the chat. It's important the chat. By, by way of context, just Hugh, that Johnny is not a public speaker. He is a developer and that's why he invites on the team. But and this has become a bit of a, a, a Frank portraying this as a battle. It's not. It's it's he wants to put forward his case for why he thinks it's appropriate. Okay, so it's not a battle. It's a discussion. Yep. Thanks, Johnny. Over to you. Johnny, can we can we still get you from where you are? Hugh, would you like us, uh, just um, waiting, for Johnny, to come on board. We, we could respond to some of the chat issues, or we could. Uh, just give some comments about some of the, the planning comments that have been made. I don't know, whatever you want. So. Well, what I think is, let's wait for Johnny, because I mean, I suppose as we originally conceived this and, and the invitation was that this was going to be a sort of, um, you know, a conversation, not a battle, but a discussion between Frank and Johnny. That's kind of how we had seen it. So ideally, we'd like to, you know. Um, yeah. How are you doing? Uh, I was just, he, he, he's, he's, he's only hearing half of what we're saying. So he's moving as we speak oh. and he'll be available in the next couple of minutes with a bit of luck. Okay. Um, well, let's just to pick up on, on the chat. It's very hard. There's a lot of comments coming through the chat, as people will see. Um, I suppose there are questions about that. I mean, I'm just trying to summarize them in passing, but um, there's certainly, I mean, there's some the questions, some of the questions have been addressed or notionally been addressed about cost. Um, I suppose there's questions about the, the mix, um, the, the mix of community that you're going to get. Um, in a place like this, um, the question about vacancy, um, you know, apartments being built by fund, bought up by funds, etc. Uh, Tom, is there something specifically there that you wanted to pick up uh, on? I suppose just generally the, the, the concept of SHDs and SDZs, the, the, the important point I would make about the document itself or the planning scheme, and this whole debate about plan-led development and development-led development planning, that this is not developer-led planning in the sense, this is, the, 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 the team has no power. The planning system will determine whether it gets permission or not, and that's on board Panola. And Dublin City Council has had a very strong role and a lot of debate, and, and Frank refers to this be, behind closed doors as this is somewhat unique. It's the same of every other application that you have meetings between the local authority and a developer. There's not, nothing new in this. And the same with SHD itself is a form of strategic infrastructure development, which has been around for the last 15 years. So it's not a, a, something that's, that's sprung it hasn't out. hasn't been around for the last 15 years. Right. SID has been around for 15 years and SHD has been around since 2016 and then enacted in 2017. actually. It's been in the act since 2016 and enacted in 2017, Frank. That's right. Yeah, thank that's you. Correct. So, um, so it's so, and the issue about whether it's democratic or not, there has been a, not an awful lot of submissions made in this. It was twenty odd submissions were made. It's actually thirty one submissions made on the scheme, which we've looked at. But there's been a lot of debate with Dublin City Council. We've made the point that our scheme 
we believe is uh, is complied what the minister want and he set out in the height strategy uh, the IDA have been looking for more density in the city and others have been looking for it so it's not just a case of a developer on a whim coming up with some scheme there's a lot of other people and other state bodies which are supportive of this more densification of this part of the city nobody objects nobody objects to densification i don't object to it either but i've I've pointed out repeatedly and will do so again. There are 2.2 million people living in central Paris and the vast majority of them are living in buildings that are no more than five to eight stories in height. You can get density in a city without going uh, 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 to the heights that are being proposed here. And it goes back to the central point that I've made, which Robin Mandel has tagged in his uh, message there. Ladies and gentlemen, the core issues here are who should determine our, how our cities are formed, the financially driven developer or the socially driven public realm. Well, unfortunately, the so socially driven public realm doesn't build apartments. That doesn't build. You live in an apartment, Frank, built by a developer. The UCD was built by developers. So like the, the public isn't providing. Like There's 100 and, 101 social housing units proposing this scheme, which is 101 social housing units more than Dublin City Council built in 2020. So here, the, the, the private sector is building at, at, at 600 at 660,000 uh, euro per unit. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's an average cost. Come on. It's not the it's total. An average, yeah. So that, that, <laughs> the average cost, that means that more, some of them are more than 700,000. Some of them may be less. Than people, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But there's nothing wrong with that as well. And yeah, we're not thinking put them out where we're seeing. Come on. Come on. What, what are the prices that people will have to pay to buy a, a private sector apartment? Or how much rent will they have to pay if they if, if, if they get into the, the build to rent element of this scheme? Well, suppose the, well, the key point is, Frank, is build to rent is about 7% of the Irish of the Irish uh, property market. So 93%. At the moment it is. At the moment it is. But there, as you know, Tom, there is a wall of money, the wall of money from foreign investors. 68% of all of the investment in the Irish residential sector last year came from foreign sources and there's a wall of money waiting to invest in buildings in Dublin whether it's for offices for apartments for student housing and so on well, isn't that and great that is, that's what that's what that is what's going on and the and what is happening is that the Irish residential sector is being commodified for international capital investment and that is what's going on and and the idea that that SHDs are going to provide a solution or the fast track route, the fast track route to onboard Panola has proved to, has, has not produced housing at all. The 72%, as of last November, 72% of all of the apartment schemes that were granted approval by onboard Panola under the SHD fast track process have not even had a sod turned on them. And you can't just use right. COVID as an excuse for that. Let's have a, can we respond to some of these points? Part of the reason, and I'm sorry, I am very keen, I'm trying to keep an eye that Johnny is back on, I'm not too sure if he is or isn't. We're trying to, we're trying to get him back in. We're, yeah. we're keeping an eye on the working room. About, the, about the, this issue, 7% of, of these units in Ireland in a housing crisis are being done by in, in institutions. Whether they're foreign, in inverted commas or not, is irrelevant, Frank. We're Europeans. It's not irrelevant. It is, well, to me, it is it's totally irrelevant who, who, where, where, where we need housing. And this is, as we've always said, is not the solution. This is one of the solutions. We need different types of sectors. And there are a lot of people working in the IFSC on very high salaries who may want to live here. The IDA have been fully supportive of providing higher end units for people who want to work in, that, in those sectors. So it's not everybody wants to live in a three bed semi in Gorey. We don't. Can you, explain, can you explain to me, Tom, as somebody who's a practitioner in the planning industrial complex, one of the leading. Sorry, by way, Frank, Frank, you, you, that's your, by the way, you all say. Yes, so, but that's what it is. Frank. That is what it is. That is what it is. That. Let's face facts and let's face facts about this. That is what's going on in this, in this city at the moment. The planning industrial complex is proposing outrageous schemes all over the place, which wouldn't have a dog's chance of getting planning permission under the normal planning process, which involves a much higher degree of public participation. And, in the, and, and on board Panola, unfortunately, has bought into the narrative that high rise equates with high density. That is not the case. We can build five to eight storey buildings, which would be perfectly reasonable for people to live in, that retain the human scale of the city, instead of imposing uh, uh, buildings that are super tall compared to anything else. And let's remember that the bulk of Docklands has already been developed. 
and therefore there is no possibility of Waterfront South Central forming part of a cluster of tall buildings at that end of the docks. And as for the protection of George in Dublin, the same developer, Johnny Ronan, has got planning permission for a building, a, a, a building of 90, 90 metres in height in Tara Street, intervening between the Custom House and Trinity College, which is at the core of George in Dublin. So, so I, I, the, Frank's going to give a lot of latitude to make a lot of sweeping yeah. statements. The yeah. building that's on Tara Street is fully plan-led development because it's in a, there's a local area plan for George's Dock and the building is fully compliant with that. I wasn't involved in that scheme, but that building is an example of plan-led development where the development of Tara Street Station built on a station for 22 storeys in the development plan, in the local area plan, and that's what's being provided. So it's not an example of developer-led planning. Um, I'm not citing this as an example of developer-led planning. I'm simply saying that the not that is it, it intervenes in George and Dublin between the Custom House and Trinity College, and I think it was a mistake to make a to make provision for that there. In well, the case, of, Water, in that the case of Waterfront South Central, there is no provision made for that in either the existing planning scheme for Docklands or in the amended version of the planning scheme. I just, can I just open back out the discussion a little bit because I'm seeing there's a number of questions in the chat which I would sort of gather under the general heading of a concern about climate and sustainability and one of them is simply asking the question how a 45 story tower can be described as carbon positive in the sense yeah, of Paul, 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 Paul O'Brien yeah, I, I can answer that there is you know if you take just pure the pure construction materials on site all of that, it is not going to be uh, carbon neutral. No building will be carbon neutral. Um, but if you take the lifetime carbon, it will be carbon neutral. But uh, and that's talking about the the lifetime. In terms of offsets, the Ronan Group have um, wind farms and uh, forestation, so they can offset through wind farms energy uh, creation. As has happened in the convention center, which is what the world's first carbon neutral uh, uh, convention center. And let me say also that, you know, the Roman Group are doing the Salesforce building beside the central bank. And we're involved in that. And that is going to be the uh, Ireland's first all electric development. So the distinction there is just to clarify is between that, the, I mean, obviously it's not a carbon neutral in terms of construction, but then in terms of operation. It, it, it will be carbon neutral in terms of construction by offsets. Uh, just to say what, you know, say if you're looking at Letty or you're talking about Reba 2030, uh, none of them are saying that you're actually going to build, uh, construct without using no carbon. You have to use carbon, but it, there are targets set for 2030. Uh, we'll be going there and hopefully beyond. But you can offset in terms of energy creation and offsets in terms of carbon on the constructions. But the buildings themselves in their operation will be uh, a, a far superior to any of the constructions that are going on around the, the country at the moment. Just a general question then as well about what, what and I, I suppose it's coming from myself as well to an extent, is what determines the height? I mean, like the previous the capital dock we refer to is something like 22 stories i think this is going up to 45 and i'm just wondering what it is i i, I can answer that if i may hugh um it, it's literally it was the assessments we did uh, with city designer all around the city uh, again i'm going to try and share my screen <laughs> frank is doing it all the time so if he can do it i must be able to do it yeah. um Part of the reason why the hue that can, can everybody see that? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you, this is a view uh, from the eleva, elevated part of the Phoenix Park. Uh, it shows, you know, the waterfront development there, but you're at an elevated viewpoint here. But you can see um, also to the right hand side, you can see Capital Docks, and to the far right, I don't know if you can see it. You're, you're, if you. You can see the uh, pool bag towers. Pool bag towers are 205 meters high. The incinerator flues are 100 meters high. So we can bench everything, you know, uh, in terms of the skylines, but we also have instruments like View City, all of that, where we walked around all of the city 
and we could see the impacts, the visual impacts uh, that we could see from various locations right through the historic core, but further afield, you know, looking down from, say, we, we again, I'm going to try and do this now, uh, if I can. Just keeping an eye on, just as... Yeah, as no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Uh, but the, the answer is we did a study uh, from all around the city and within the city itself. So, so just to understand, the idea is that that's an except, it should not go higher in terms of a view, but I mean, why would it not go lower? Or what's the correlation? Uh, so, so one of the most, I, I don't know if Richard's still on the call, but one of the uh, main things that we saw was, you know, the, the walk down along Dame Street. And as you approach Trinity College, um, when you're further from Trinity College, uh, right up towards, you know, the, the St. Patrick's, you can actually get a glimpse in the distance of, of the top of the towers. But as you approach Trinity, uh, it disappears. So we use that as a bench. Why not lower? Um, we did look at lower buildings, um, but it's also about uh, the elegance uh, in, in terms of the slenderness of the buildings. And you get to a certain stage where they look uh, more dumpy and squatter. Yeah, I'm just. I, I, I don't. Uh, can I? Can I just interject here? I don't think it's. I don't think it is enormously relevant uh, to look at the at this proposed development from a long distance perspective, from you know the Dublin Mountains or from the Phoenix Park or whatever. What is so staggering? is this image really. This is, this is the image that tells the story. This is the piece of Manhattan that they propose to impose on a site in Docklands where all of the other buildings are going to be completely dwarfed by it, including the Capitol Dock Tower on the other side of the river, which I admit is a dreary, uh, dull uh, piece of architecture. Uh, compared to what's proposed uh, at Waterfront South Central on the North Wall Quay site. But really, this is a, an image of the scale. If you can pick out Liberty Hall in the very far, in the distance in that view, it just looks like a small little stump compared to what's being proposed here. And all of the other buildings were built in compliance with the Dublin City Council planning scheme for the area, which was democratically adopted by the City Council members. Why should an exception be made in this case when everywhere around it has already been developed and there is no possibility of creating any kind of a high rise cluster that would make sense of this? This is developer led planning par excellence and it, there is no justification for it. There is no democratic mandate for it. And the only way they can get planning permission is by going through an unelected process the faceless people on board Panola will make the decision and hopefully it will end up being reviewed by the High Court and thrown out. Because if we want to get heights of this kind, if, if there is a lobby for heights of this kind in the city, it really needs to go through the planning process. And the, the city plan is currently under review. Let us all make our representations. Let us make a democratic decision about the future of Dublin, rather than leaving it in the hands of the plan of the planning industrial complex and the developers. I can I suggest that you, you, you do that in this case? I mean, it is still, we're still in a democratic country. You make a representation still on board Planola. On board Planola, on board Planola has clearly <laughs> shown, has Correct clearly you. shown on, on that it's on the side of Frank, the can I speak, law. please? Let, uh, let's um, let... You made the point that from this view, which of course is from a helicopter or some such raised view, that the that this, that, that, um, uh, that the tower um, Liberty Hall uh, looks tiny in comparison. Well, of course it does because of the distance. When I, I stand, at, let, let me finish. When we stand at Liberty Hall, which bears down on the Custom House, we look along this valley and we see this scheme. And it is quite small in relation to the context you're looking at. The reverse is exactly the same. 
Okay, it is a much bigger building. Calling it Manhattan is rather ridiculous because we're talking about a singular development. It is a cluster, a small cluster, but it is a, a singular thing, rather like the Shard is a singular thing, rather like the Shard is very much larger scale than the immediate buildings around it. I mean, there's nothing new about that and you praise that scheme. So to compare it with Liberty Hall, this dear little 17 story building, sweet building it is, totally inefficient and, and, and now uh, unable to operate to full capacity because it simply doesn't function. Uh, that also needs replacing and it would be replaced with a taller building and that's to come. And Liberty <laughs> Hall is about a kilometer from this site. It can't form any redevelopment of Liberty Hall at a higher scale and bulk uh, uh, is not going is not going to form part of any cluster with this building. What are you suggesting? <laughs> All of the intervening buildings should That's be my behind. point. And let's and let's uh, you know create Manhattan on the on the river on the on the River Liffey. Well, I mean, uh, but Frank, as you pointed out, a lot of the de I mean, a lot of the docks is now already developed. There isn't actually exactly, yeah. for. Um, is that all to be demolished? And, and let's <coughs> think again and, and, and it, it, a high rise cluster, a big high rise cluster in Docklands. Listen, the Docklands has already been developed. This, there is hardly any site left apart from this. There's no significant large brownfield site as they make the point themselves that's available in Docklands for redevelopment, except for this one. And they are proposing buildings that are grossly out of scale with everything else that has been built in Docklands, including the Capitol Dock Tower, which is the tallest residential building in the city at the moment. And, you know, uh, I mean, this is a decision that needs to be made by the people of Dublin through their elected representatives and not by on board Planola, which, which has clearly bought into the, the notion that higher density uh, it can only be achieved by building uh, uh, high-rise buildings of this of this type, and I think that's completely on that, uh, that point, Frank. You mentioned Paris, up to eight stories, giving rise to high density. You're absolutely right, but that's across the whole city. As yes, you've admitted yourself. This is one site left in Docklands. Eight-story buildings on this site will never produce the same density that the scheme does. So that's an irrelevant point. But can it's I just put an irrelevant point? It's a huge leap in scale in terms of docklands. In the context in which the buildings would be located, they will be they will stand out in enormously compared to everything else around. Can I just pull back a little bit? Because I suppose I should just note that in the chat, there's certainly a number of voices. I mean, that are kind of enthused when you showed this image, Frank. It did get a number of positive reactions that I are not as far as I know, from people who are invested in the, in the project directly, right? They're just points of view. So I guess there would be people, just strictly speaking from a point of view, who would look at this image and think that was, yeah, please, let's, why not? That's, it's, it's part and parcel of what a city might be in its own terms. It's a handsome piece of design. It seems to be thinking the right way in terms of carbon neutrality, etc. I mean, is, is there, on the one hand, there's a series of arguments against it to do with density, to do with the way in which it's being going through planning. And then on the other hand, there seems to be a sort of, let's say, a, a, a basic reaction against the idea of height per se in this place. So there's a sort of rational <laughs> argument, but then there's also almost an emotional argument, either for or against, it feels like. Yeah, there, there are people who love high-rise buildings. There are people yeah. to, who go to Dubai on their holidays because they're just so impressed by all the high-rise buildings in Dubai, uh, including the Burj Khalifa Tower and so on and so forth. And, you know, like, why should Dublin become like other places? Why should Dublin become an anywhere city? Why shouldn't Dublin retain the things that are important about, about the city, which is largely its human scale? And, you know, the idea that we should uh, allow developers to determine what's going to happen is just anathema to me. Uh, uh, Tom or John? Yeah, Hugh, I just want to say, back on the call. Sorry, so. I'm just, just concerned. We haven't been able to get Johnny back on the call. I'm just wondering, and I'm really sorry, because the vast majority of people wanted to hear Johnny and yes. Frank on this. So is there a potential to reconvene another one? Because there's a lot of issues covering this from SHDs to the height, et cetera, and we're not... We're quite happy for Johnny to come on again. Or sorry, he is. <coughs> well, it's not I mean, that 
that, he, that, that, he, that he want to avoid doing it. So just yeah. I want anyone to perceive that we were kind of deliberately had a few presentations and then he yeah. actually disappeared. So we're very keen that we give given another opportunity and happy to do so. Frank, what do you think? Oh, I, have, I have no problem. I, have okay. no problem. I mean, I, I, I didn't expect that I would be <laughs> facing a whole team of people. No, I know that as well. And I'm conscious of that. From uh, the Ronan group yeah. and, its, and its planning and other advisors. Uh, I would quite, I would have no problem having a, a discussion with Johnny Ronan about it. We go back a long time. Yeah, exactly. So if we could, if we could do that, I think, we, I mean, from our point of view, we can, we can certainly host that. We're happy to do that. Sometimes. Just apologise on our behalf because it's it's been very frustrating for us and the team as well because we keep on looking to see if Johnny's re returned back again. So yeah, yeah, we're very keen that it happens. So can I just give one quick thing just to back to to Frank's point about SHDs. The reason why a lot of SHD schemes aren't being developed is because of the of the propensity of people to judicially review them. A lot of them are held up in court, and there are a lot of developers chomping at the bit to build housing, both be it social housing and private housing and other type of housing, but can't because they're stuck in limbo. Of court cases and there's like one in four shd schemes are in court so it's that's there are a lot of reason behind it not to the develop. reason the reason for that tom quite simply is that a lot an awful lot of people object to developer-led planning as exemplified by the shd process where in the case of for example the bailey gibson site on south circular road um the uh, on board panola granted planning permission for that in defiance of its own planning inspector who Produced a 141-page report <laughs> recommending <laughs> that permission be refused, <laughs> and also and also casting aside numerous objections from local people. And I take my hat off to the two brave local residents who are challenging that in the High Court. And I wish I, that I just, say, just this, a lot of opinions here on it. My practice has reviewed the first 250 schemes. The board has an average since 1994 of overturning 13 percent of inspectors reports and the same in SHD there's no difference so as it's been often portrayed in different I know it's one or two journalists on the call that there are it's often been portrayed in different media articles that SHDs are rubber stamped by the board they're not the same ratio is roughly around 10 percent for for SHDs and 13 percent for conventional applications the board go against the, the recommendation of an inspector and that's the right of the board so it's not as if there's a major difference between the two outcomes and the same board and it's a very unfair of you to talk about people public servants who can't defend themselves in public i can defend myself i'm in the private sector but to say they're their faces they're not there are people that you know and people who've come up and who would do a very good job i don't always agree with them and sometimes i do and sometimes i don't but you should retract your comments about the board it's inappropriate no, I, I mean, I'm simply pointing, making the difference that the, that the board is an unelected body. It is a po an, appointed, the an appointed body. By the minister. And it has, and, and it has also bought into the thesis that high rise equates with high de higher density. They haven't bought into any thesis in front of because the board have refused 22% of all SHDs, not all which are tall buildings, have been refused. And that is a higher rate than the conventional application, 7% of all applications <laughs> go to appeal. And there's a higher rate of, of overturning SHDs than the conventional. So Frank, please start introducing facts into your opinions at some stage, and then we'll have a better debate. Oh, come on now, Tom. You, you, said, you said on radio a few weeks ago that I opposed the convention centre, and that is completely untrue. Totally and utterly it's untrue. True, Frank. Totally Frank. and utterly untrue. You'd say anything to get away with it. Frank, that's totally, that's totally wrong. Even at your standard, okay. it's wrong. So let's maybe, I think at this stage, it might be best if we try to um, let's bring this maybe to a conclusion. I mean, conscious we were already running a little over time. This is supposed to be an hour long event, but I, I, I would like to take up that proposal if Frank is willing. Um, to, to regroup. What I'm going to suggest is we've had an awful lot of input into the chat, which we've only really had time to dip into. Um, so we're going to gather all of that. Um, and then if we can reconvene where we can have something, I suppose, akin to, let's say we've had the preliminaries, and I think we know a lot more about the project. Um, so maybe the next time we might, might focus on Frank and Johnny um, just ex having a conversation, I think, really about the future of the city, because I think it's probably fair to say that both are invested in the future of the city and have a belief in cities um, and have a kind of faith, you know, in our continuing need uh, for living cities. So, I mean, I think if we can make that the focus of our discussion, 
and we'll take these comments and input and we'll try to make sense of it maybe and then we'll generate from that a series of points and questions that we'll put into the conversation for frank and johnny to to debate 